it's a great pleasure and honor for me today to welcome Martin Bethold from Harvard University Graduate School of Design. He got his education here in Europe, in Aachen, and then his PhD he got from Harvard University, and then they didn't let him go from America. And he did lo he works lots of, I know, I had the opportunity to be in his team. And he also started with robotic groups. Now he's leading material processes and systems groups. He did lots of the research. He has lots of the PhD students. And now I'm really curious to see what he did in the last time or maybe in the last months. Martin, floor is yours, and please enjoy this talk. Okay, great. Thank you, Milena, for the introduction. It's great to be here. Can you all hear me? Is the audio good? Okay, good, good. Um, yeah, great morning session. Love the presentations, conversations. I'm, I'll add my street tag to the mix in the hope that by the end of the day we'll have a uniformly illuminated scene, right? That's the idea, right? Jim? Am I good with that? All right. So let me start by introducing the team. Uh, so a lot of what I show is obviously collaborative very much. Uh, that's the nature of the group. Uh, not everybody in this slide has pitched in. I'll show you later on who has. So beyond the actual group at Harvard, we also entertain um, a lot of collaborations, but our focus is actually materials. So having me here in a, in a venue that is focused on geometry may not seem obvious. I hope, and I, and I admit my story will be slightly windy, so please bear with me. I hope it'll become clear, okay? My focus is materials, uh, looking at the issues on the left, uh, with a sort of focus on collaboration with material science, looking at computational uh, means, structures, and robotics. And I want to say that uh, we, we really enjoy collaborations with a with broad range of scientists, uh, both in the US as well as in Europe. Um, and today I'll focus on the, the work that we do around materials and computation. We have a whole other sort of cluster of projects that are more on design, cognition, and environmental psychology. Those will be sort of not mentioned today. Um, so generally speaking, the work in materials, we focus on doing more with fewer materials. Uh, and in part that is because we recognize that at the end of the life cycle of a building, when it's time to demolish and re 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 recycle, it's very difficult to do so because we're putting so many materials so closely together and we're so good at connecting them for eternity. So separating these materials becomes very difficult. And there's other challenges as well that I might be mentioning along the way. So we want to do more with less. I'll focus a bit on ceramics today. I'll just give you a sense, in the US, we're using uh, an area of tiles every year that is about this large. This is New York City, this is Manhattan and Brooklyn. Uh, so these are areas where we have a lot of people. Um, so it's, it's, it's a lot of tile. So this is a kind of big industry. Uh, we work with uh, partners in Spain mostly for many years. Um, so that's sort of going to be the material system that I'm going to use to sort of work through some general issues today. Uh, let me start somewhere completely different, not so far from here in Stübing near Graz, where I enjoyed my sabbatical um, at, at the TU there. So in a pre-industrial age, the way we put buildings together was by minimal shaping these materials as they were extracted from nature and then doing a lot of manipulations uh, on site, right there. There was no point trying to come up with standard materials that we could then process on site. Instead, we basically took the logs and put them together as we saw best possible. Right? Now, that made sense then because obviously there was no building industry. There were craftspeople that were able to do this quite well, and that's how things like this come about. And we've done some work on doing this kind of thing robotically. We're not going to talk about it today. It's sort of possible, but I don't want to go there today. Now, in the a, in a next phase, in a kind of semi-industrial phase, we began to process materials, and it was still a craft-based industry. So to making these terracotta tiles, people would build by hand plaster molds that they would press ceramics in, they could then produce multiples of the same mold, which was, of course, much cheaper than doing the same thing in stone. What people really wanted was stone, but those who couldn't afford stone, they would do the same thing with ceramics. So we began to be quite inventive 
and kind of leveraging sort of small-scale production efforts that were beginning to develop in a kind of pre-semi-industrial production mode. And today, of course, if you look at ceramics, this is what it looks like. We have tolerances within the millimeter range, even less. Uh, the colors are highly predicted. So we now have an industry that is well-developed and will make things for us that we can just use as architects, okay? Now, before that happens, though, and what we don't tend to look at so much is that there's a lot of processing involved before we get to shape anything, right? So when you visit a, a ceramic manufacturing plant, you're going to see things like this. This is all about mixing the material, drying it, bringing it to the exactly correct particle size. A lot of effort spent in doing that. And vast amounts of spaces in these manufacturing facilities are dedicated to material preparation. And only because of that can we then produce very straightforward flat geometries. So let's keep in mind the industry is still focused on making flat things, but doing them actually is not possible without going through the trouble of preparing the materials so that we are 100% certain that we know what we have when it comes to shaping products. And this is true for all materials, pretty much. And these factories are then highly automated. Things get moved around on robots. You really don't see a lot of people. The few people you see, they, they sort of go around on bicycles to kind of make sure the robots are doing their work, right? But this is very, very different as a model from that initial hut that I showed, right? So this is sort of the, 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 what we are, where we are right now. I just want to bring that sort of context in. And that only that sort of industry allows us then to produce things with these very highly controlled materials. So this is an installation a few years ago using very large, very precise tiles, ceramic tiles, that we can use to make these installations that are a bit unusual, uh, sort of origami-like things. They also tend to be quite durable, so these things will easily last 50 years outside. Uh, this is, uh, so this is still out there in Spain after about 10 years. We can make structural assemblies, right? We can actually use tile to produce structural forms. So this is a little grid shell that we made a few years ago, made out of tile, right? Um, so a little unusual, but the only reason we can do this is that the entire material production system is completely controlled, right? There's no uncertainty there. So a few years ago, we got interested in sort of a, a different pathway, and that was to kind of... Um, we sort of learn to love the fact that there's some aspect of ceramic where you really don't control things so well. So we began to, we offered a workshop in Sydney with, with some wonderful colleagues, uh, Nathan, Alex, Dagmar, Kate, and what we did there, we sort of connected sensor input in real time with 3D printing, right? So the sensors could be voice, could be movement, any number of things. So it was sort of an exploratory thing, right? We weren't solving a problem. We were actually exposing a problem because as we were doing this, obviously the material didn't always appreciate what we were trying to do with this. Things failed, things cracked. So we sort of exposed in a way the obvious dilemmas in this material that well, there's a lot of uncertainty and lots of things can be done, but we don't quite know beforehand what can or cannot be done. So we just began to take note of that. Um, and this is actually, all right, so, so that sort of triggered our interest in beginning to just quantify that uncertainty, right? Uh, the industry has solved uncertainty through massive Im investments in material preparation and processing. How can we go another way? Um, so at, at some point, um, way before the pandemic, we would do an annual exhibition in Spain at a trade fair show where our job was to show so the other things we can do with tiles, okay? And we interpreted that broadly as anything you can do with ceramics that is not making flat tiles, okay? Uh, so we created a project around 3D printing a small structure, and, and this is the final geometry of the pieces. The bumpy surface actually has to do with the fact that we're working together with colleagues that are looking at natural ventilation of buildings. So the bumpiness increases the surface area and that will influence the rate of heat exchange between that system and the air. And you would fill this with, let's say, sand to have a kind of thermal mass. So the bumpiness is not just design, there's a bit of a profound alibi around it, I would, I would say it like that, because, you know, at least we, we made an attempt, right? Uh, so knowing that there were a lot of uncertainties down the road in producing 
that number of tiles, we decided to create a completely parametric model where everything could be changed to the very last moment and it would trickle down to the two paths themselves that we were going to use to print those tiles, right? Subdividing uh, and, and doing a lot of things uh, that, again, we, we were able to change things down the road and it would sort of ripple through the entire model. So there's a fair amount of investment in time uh, we, we began to kick, figure out then, based on the maximum two path we could actually print in Spain with our partners, what was the division uh, in pieces that we could actually feasibly produce here for this module, for this pavilion. So that gave us a subdivision, then we were dealing with structure. It's a simple steel structure behind, so nothing very structural. Uh, so the, the discretization. And at that point, we were still thinking just making the two hollow shells and sort of get away with it. And of course, there was no way, right? I think we don't spend much time probably at these events to just seeing all the failures, right? There are lots of failures. For one success, usually there's 10 failures, right? Let's be honest. And that's how it works in my world, right? It's just how it is, right? And you've got to love them. Otherwise, you're never going to learn, right? So these things are ugly. They don't work. And so we moved on. And eventually, we sort of honed in, right? We changed clay bodies. We went from an earthenware to a stoneware, that helped. And that is all collaborative uh, with our partners in Spain, but also with the artists at the Harvard Ceramics Studio. So it, we kind of really work with both art and science in this product. So we had a geometry, um, and again, then we started sort of prototyping the process, both at Harvard and in Spain. We had to make sure we had the same clay mix, similar machines. So, so a lot of parallel worlds because the production was going to be local in Spain because there was no way that we were going to make these at Harvard and ship them. Shipping costs would have been crazy even then. Um, all right, so and these are a few images or videos of just actually the, the Spanish production. So we work with um, Ceramic Research Institute. This is basically scientists who, who are ceramic material scientists. They sort of work on specific projects. Doing this was very, very unusual for them. They were very happy to go on the journey as they bought this little printer. Um, and when we redesigned the whole pavilion because this printer actually had a smaller canister, so we had to re-modularize the whole system, so the parametric work did pay off. Uh, but they would print these elements over many weeks, there's just one printer, they would fire them in the, in the kiln. But um, in the end, we had these elements which were fired. So this is before firing. Um, and um, the, this was opened, and it was, you know, we didn't quite get everywhere everything done. But if you look closely, eh, it's not that great, right? I mean, yeah, if you look, go far away, it's pretty good. But, you know, the gaps are big, things are sagging. so. Okay, so this was sort of an extreme case. These elements are inclined, they have the bum, so this is sort of a form that's challenging to print. Now, it turns out it was a perfect sort of extreme case to, to, to generate some data, right? Because as we saw the kind of uncertainties involved here, we decided to, a uh, one way to tackle the uncertainty here, we can't control the clay body anymore. The printing is what it is. Um, and there's lots of deformation, why we print, why we dry, it's just, it's, it's pretty difficult. So we decided to, um, and this is sort of just a basic cylinder drying over two days, so we can get 10, 15% of shrinkage. The shrinkage won't be uniform either, so it's very difficult to really understand this. So we decided to scan those elements in Spain to begin to quantify the deviations we got, and, and as a basis, just to build up some, some data around this to, to use later, uh, just to basically capture that. So we set up, we bought a, we bought a scanner uh, in Spain, we hired somebody to do this, and then that person was scanning all the bricks so we could finally sort of quantify how much do we actually deviate from what we wanted, right? Um, and this is just some of the images, sorry for the color coding, we can't do this with vectors or graphic statics here. Um, so lots of deviations. Uh, and, and it turns out it's very difficult to simulate this. So this is where we're leaving geometry behind, okay? If it was just a geometrical problem, we might be able to simulate it. And we did nonlinear FEA, so it's sort of the best we can do. It's not even close, right? What happens? Well, the clay will dry, and it'll change stiffness as we print, right? Now, th that is very difficult to simulate as a, as a computational problem, right? Because it might take several hours to print, and at that time, the lower layer will be drying out, right? It actually dries out very quickly. And the stiffness of that layer will not be the same at the beginning as it is in the end. 
So it's a highly nonlinear system that is really difficult to simulate. So we, sort of, we saw this and said, okay, well, maybe we'll go back to this later. Right? Um, and that's sort of just want to acknowledge um, there's the Harvard team, but then wonderful group of scientists uh, who helped us in Spain to make this all happen. Um, so it was our, our first attempt to kind of capture the uncertainty. We then moved on to a sort of more challenging project, which is unfired clay, uh, but it's making these lattices. And this was done by a group of students who will be mentioned later. One of them is still with us. Um, it became a really good alibi to kind of test other methods to capture data. And right now, we're actually still working on this to kind of do some more advanced computation work around this. So what we're doing here, we're basically spanning these very thin uh, sort of beads of ceramics sort of in space without support. There's no fibers in there, it's just ceramics. So it actually does have some tensile capacity um, in the wet state, and we could dry it, and it'll actually still look pretty much like that. So uh, the idea here is that the two path it performs essentially the, uh, a complex movement in space that allows us to kind of put these beads across. So we're not going along the line that we're going to have. We're going to do a sort of choreography, a dance in space to actually bridge the gaps. So it's sort of an extreme scenario. We found this quite interesting. We have to change the, the flow of the material. We have to flow this, to change the speeds. So a lot of parameters have to be changed to be able to bridge without support with this clay, which is basically wet, uh, more stiff than, I mean, stiffer than toothpaste, right? If you just to give you something, uh, but not much stiffer, right? So it's very, very soft. So we can do sort of impossible things through this robotic approach. So there was a lot of work to kind of understand where, would, where do we have to linger, where do we have to be quick, where do we have to be slow. So it's a very complex operation, essentially heuristically derived through lots of trial and error, lots of failures, trying on different patterns. Uh, and if we don't do anything, then we'll get this, okay? Which you've all probably been there, it's a complete mess, you know? Because what happens, of course, this system now sags so much while it dries that, you know, a point should be here, but really down here. So obviously, if you put material here, you'll get disaster, right? So this became a nice, a nice way to now come up with another way of taming that uncertainty. And that involved uh, setting up a system of scanning all the time in real time and actually drying a bit with a heat gun. So we tried to dry things out quickly with a heat gun. And we scanned positions and then recalibrated all the two paths. Right? We actually have three two paths here. We have the actual printing. We have the heating two path as we heat. And then we have the sensing two path. So the robot does three things, right? Depositing, heating, and sensing. Um, so once we have that scan, the toolpath gets recalibrated in real time, gets corrected for the new location, and then we run the next layer. So after each layer, we're printing, we're sort of heating, and then we're sensing. And then the toolpath gets recalibrated, and we go back and, and, and do the next layer. So, um, uh, so that was, was all done, and so the machina serves as a, as a bridge between here. So machina was built by my colleague, Jose Lewis, um, it's a sort of uh, robot, uh, robot uh, programming interface that allows a lot of real-time interaction. So that's been our main platform for all the work we do in this area. So here's just uh, the scanning. We're just capturing a single point. So this is early days, right? So a single point at the apex of that, of that node gets captured, uh, that data gets processed, and then again, the two path gets, um, gets uh, recalibrated. That gave us you know, reasonably good blocks, and then we're going to go for glory. We said, okay, we want to do something big. Okay, all these things worked out pretty well. We can vary the spacing of, of the nodes, etc. And you know, on the left, you're seeing things get a bit extreme. Right? We just can't bridge that much anymore. And this is measuring about uh, 12 centimeters across. So it's, you know, it's something, right? So it's sort of a brick-sized element. Uh, so we decided to go for something bigger. Uh, this is about the biggest we can do with the GC. We're very, very tight on space. This is in the basement. The robot is constrained to not go too high because it would ruin the HVAC pipe. So, uh, so over about 24 hours, the three students would print this, would be always filling the canister. Uh, and you can see even the color changing. The, clearly, now the lower layers will be drying out. The upper layers are wet. So they basically printed sort of a phone booth size element. Now, some of you are too young to know what a phone booth is. Sorry, but I still do. Um, anyhow, so um, they, they put a lot of effort into it. 
Uh, and you can see the, the gradation of color, right? So again, it's a highly nonlinear behavior. We would have not been able to do this without actually capturing the position and recalibrating the true path, right? So we had this thing in the end, which is sort of an extreme construction, right? It's all unfair. Clay is actually stable enough to, after dry to kind of move it outside on a, on a rolling platform. Um, and there it is. Um, and you can see we're going pretty slow vertically. The material really compresses, right? Uh, but sort of too much material flows out of the nozzle, so it goes wider. We need that support, right? So a lot of sort of careful conservation. Uh, see that these are the students: Suleiman Alotman, Francisco Jung, and uh, Hyunji Im. Jose Luis, um, again, he's faculty now. He was actually already teaching then. A great person. Uh, so this was sort of our first foray into kind of capturing real-time fabrication information and correcting it, right? Uh, now we're sort of going in the next phase. This is really the work by Suleiman Allotman, um, and this will be actually be presented uh, in a few weeks at Arcadia, so I'll be very sort of uh, gentle about this. We want to use machine learning to actually really correct now the true path to get more predictable outcomes, okay? That's the broad idea. Um, so the first thing we need, we need lots of good data, right? Uh, so the question was, well, how do we very quickly get massive amounts of data? Because it'll be unsupervised learning, so we need lots and lots of data points that are good. Uh, so right now we have a new setup. We're using a 3D structured light scanner that captures a lot more data, not just point spot elevation, but captures obviously the surface data. So we got lots of information. Uh, we still use a heat gun. Um, and a number of other things that are all integrated into essentially a system that produces these prototypes that we really only have because we need the training data. Right? So we're, right now we're in a data acquisition phase and we're kind of wrapping up. Uh, we're still doing recalibration, that works really well on this. Um, so we're getting good block size elements, kind of you know, brick size with this approach. Um, you can see the scan, obviously, we're getting entire surface areas, and we have algorithms that select the areas that we actually need to investigate and do some, do some math on that area to make sure uh, we can understand exactly what happens on that surface. Um, so again, that's going to be presented in a few weeks at Acadia, so I'll just give you a bit of a preview. But the big idea is to put a lot more effort into this project to kind of come up with a different alternative strategy to not have the processing, have the optimization on the processing side, but be smarter about the actual manufacturing fabrication side to do things in a predictable way. All right, um, a, a few more things. Um, this one here, I think, so just hold that there. We'll go back to it later. Um, deals with a slightly different topic, but it, in the end, they all connect for me. Um, so just bear with me. This is about really reducing the assembly complexity uh, by having fewer materials do more things. So this is really about multi-material printing. Right now, when we build buildings or anything, we basically assemble things together, mostly materials that are not the same, some of which are bonded for eternity, let's say with silicone, right? Uh, think about curtain walls, very hard to do anything with, right? Good luck pulling those apart. So um, we assemble things, right? So what about if we could print? different materials have different functions in different portions with the same material, with the same workflow. It would help us in the assembly uncertainty, but it would also reduce material, the material mix at the end of life stage, right? dealing with that recycling challenge that we need to take quite seriously. So in, in the ceramic world, the sort of precedent is these encaustic tiles that don't have a glaze, but where the pattern of the tile it is produced through clay bodies with different colors, right? That's a long tradition. The nice thing about these tiles is that when you have them in historic buildings, you can grind them down even after 50 years and they'll look like new, right? So they actually have potentially a very, very long lifespan. So we started to produce a kind of very simple version which is sort of just having basically pushing two clay bodies through a single nozzle and there's different kinds of nozzles um, some basically create a split, some the material is inside another material, so there are lots of other things. Um, again, a lot of iterations to get this done. Um, sort of various configurations, v shape So we really have to reduce the kind of friction in these nodules to get a, get a better flow and a more predictable material mixing behavior there. So we used that system, did a lot of tests to understand how does the movement of the nozzle 
what kind of patterns that they produce and what are the lead times or lag times, quantifying all of that, and then beginning to print just simple 2D patterns, um, sort of in the tradition of these encaustic tiles, so just begins just learning, well, what can we do with this, right? Um, just producing these, these tile patterns uh, and learning the kind of two-path geometry, what to actually, how to handle all that, producing some more or less legible prototypes, the Harvard H uh, always does a good job, and then kind of going a bit up in, in space, also be doing three-dimensional elements, uh, where we're going to have layers, we can have a liner, we can have you know, different sides, uh, we can transition in a more smooth way, we can produce these patterns on the right there. So there are a number of aesthetic possibilities with this approach. Um, so we sort of try to capture those, even though that wasn't really the intention, but we want to capture them along the ride, right? So these are actually pretty nice, nice things. So they're just done by rotating the nozzle. It's very sort of simple in a sense. Um, and we had a pretty good way to kind of predict these shapes. Um, and that really, but again, we're seeing cracks. So there, there's the same sort of material uncertainty will still hit us here. So eventually we might be able to sort of tame that as well through the computational approach that I showed previously. Here the complexity gets greater, right? Because with two different clay bodies interacting, that has its own complexities and challenges for sure. Uh, just let me skip over this. So all this is sort of, because um, I think I'm supposed to be wrapping up. So. Um, again, this is just actually the vertical aid. It's a kind of fun part here. We can actually print vertical pieces. The nozzle holds the piece in place while it prints. It's kind of interesting, you know? It's essentially too slender. It should tip over, right? But it actually doesn't because the, the, having the nozzle there actually helps. You know? So there's some interesting discoveries. We always love the kind of serendipity of the discovery along the way, right? Um, and that's sort of the freedom we give ourselves as design researchers. Um, anyhow, so you're seeing how this kind of works. It's really just a rotation, a very simple idea. And there's lots of pasta that is producing, like the two-color pasta, a two-color toothpaste, kind of similar idea, right? So a lot of inspiration from food. We looked at that a bit. Uh, and there's some really fun examples there, which I'm not sharing today. So um, obviously, this is the same piece. You turn it over, you're getting the kind of negative image. And it's pretty rough. I, I accept that, you know. Then you could go and grind it, and it would be pretty flat, right? But again, these are just rough prototypes um, and some pieces um, that are sort of more refined. So the next phase of this is now to taking that idea into a more performative sort of service, OK? Um, and, um, and really what we sort of wanted to tackle is the, is the problem of cooling, um, <clears throat> uh, which normally needs sort of assembly. So these are, this is a typical window AC unit. You find very, a, a lot in the United States. As things get hotter in the summer, you're finding even more of them. They produce massive amounts of uh, heat outside. They also use refrigerants, which are pretty harmful, and they use up a lot of electricity, of course. So we came up with a, a nano clay, a clay body that actually uh, helps here. So this is an experiment we did actually in 2016 with Anthony Kane. We had a, a, a material system where we could treat the ceramic, and it would then either basically re resist any kind of water and vapor penetration or would let water penetrate through. So on the right-hand side, that cup, which is the same as the one on the left, is filled with water inside. Where there's no treatment, the water will penetrate through. This is a very porous clay body, which intentionally is produced to be porous. So we have a way to, to control water penetration through a fired clay body through this nano treatment. Okay? Uh, so, and then in, in a, so when I had a, a brainstorming session with a lot of material scientists, designers, architects, and we came up with the idea of maybe we can use this to control moisture and humidity in evaporative cooling systems. Okay? And that's basically what this is about. So we have a way to have the ceramic prevent, transmit moisture. But the ceramic is actually very good thermally. It has a really nice thermal behavior. And we call this uh, a super hydrophobic nanoarchitecture process. That's why the, the, so the, whole, the, the acronym here is cold snap. Um, and, and first tried it on flat tiles. We tried it on 3D printed systems. But the idea was that this is a system that is suitable for buildings, that is all about ceramics, and it leverages its unique behavior. So what happens really on the nanoscale, this is from the patent, there's a sort of roughness that develops that we can then treat, and it basically prevents water from penetrating. 
So it's really a, a, a kind of manipulation of the material on that nano scale. And so of a few years later, we, we partnered up with a company called Samca in Spain. They produced extrusions for us, uh, which we then treated with that system. And this is just a prototype. Uh, we got some press release in Fast Company that we set, the, set up this prototype in, in a building we have, and we're actually measuring now what this does for cooling in an actual building scenario. This is Jonathan Grinnan there, who's been leading that project from our end. Um, and at the same time, we were developing a kind of multi-material printing technology around this, because the goal was to eventually produce the piece, the, the manifold that gets the air in the different channels to make this, to do this with 3D printing, also with ceramics, right? So we actually basically reworked all our process around the multi-material printing to be able to now actually print that element that has the clay body with a nano treatment in some portions of that sort of element, and other portions are just a regular porous clay body. So we actually make that piece now, which is functional um, on a 3D printer. Again, a lot of sort of custom building of things. This is uh, earlier designs uh, and an earlier prototype. Uh, so this has not really been published, so I'll just show you a bit of a preview here. So the idea, again, is to do more with fewer processes and systems. It's still just ceramics. You could grind it up, it could become grog, and basically dry ceramic additive in a new ceramic element. It would not be a problem, right? So there's, there's nothing that actually sort of inhibits the life cycle to close that life cycle of the material. Now, other related work, we just have a paper coming out uh, where we're 3D printing foam ceramic on the left and solid ceramic. Uh, this is together with the Studart group at the ETH in Zurich. So here again, the approach is let's increase functionality by a single process using a single, single material. It's just ceramic, and it does insulation, and it does thermal mass. And other work, so, and, and so again, the agenda here is, broadly speaking, that we want to begin to sort of tame the uncertainty of these natural materials that are not highly processed, right, through computational process, essentially now through machine learning, we're beginning that work uh, to get away from the sort of reliance on highly processed industrial materials to be able to use natural materials that are not highly processed for the sake of a kind of more sustainable built environment. So that's the big agenda here. We're doing some other work on this area. This is a 3D printed object using algae. Uh, so this is a carbon negative material. It's a product out of the wastewater treatment plant. So it's a byproduct that we don't really do anything with right now. So we actually make elements with that compressor strength roughly like wood. So this actually might become a material that we can use in buildings. Again, great amount of uncertainty about the form here. So we're trying to tame all that now with some of the computational work that we're just starting to do that will be going on for a bit longer. And I think that is almost the end of my story. So everything you've seen, these folks here were part of that and they were really very instrumental. It's a great group. Um, uh, everybody has different capacities and interests. Uh, some, we have some postdocs, we have research associates, and then we have doctoral students. So it's really a collective production. Uh, funding partners want to acknowledge all of those, Ask Cartel of Spain, Civizama Valencia, and then a lot of others uh, sort of chipped in. And I think with that I'm done, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, thank you so much for giving us so much information and also, I hope, inspiration for future work. Do we have some question from you? Yes, please. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question with respect to uh, filtering the filtering? air. Filtering? Yes. So how can the system, how, I, I think it's extremely interesting what you propose. How could be the system um, make, how can one make sure that the air is clean? Yeah. So basically, I think this would be the next challenge. I, I'm not sure, maybe you, you have already yeah, ideas yeah, yeah. about. So uh, you talk about the cold snap system. So we have, so let me go a little bit. Uh, so we have a, a wet channel, right? That's where the water does the evaporative work. That's where the, the temperature cools down. But then we have 
the temperature sort of transmits through the ceramic to the dry channel, and that is the air that we're actually getting into the building. So the wet air, even if it has some mold, does not never get into the building. So that, that kind of, the first thing, there's a system approach to this, right? Second thing is then, I mean, we haven't run a long-term study. We did that study on the house over a period of a few weeks, so we don't know yet what those challenges will be. But the, the good thing is here, because we're splitting the wet sort of working air and the dry product air, the dry product air will not be moist and there will not be, there shouldn't be an issue with any kind of growth, bacteria, fungi, anything like that, but remains to be seen, you know? But you would still have basically, the, the air would not necessarily be uh, purified. No, no, the yes. system is not, is, not, is not made to purify air. That would have to be done in, in somewhat of a different way. And keep in mind, the air could be inside air that simply recirculates, or it could be outside air that we draw in, right? Right now, we just know that we can, we can cool air with, by evaporating water. That cool air is also dry. Because normally when you, when you use ev evaporative cooling, you're getting moist, cold air, which for human comfort isn't the best thing, right? So right now, that, that's where we are. We're going we're gonna to demonstrate whether our models are correct by running that system in that space in that building, right? And then, so that's the first question to answer. I if it holds true, what we're hoping for, then we're going to go further and sort of investigate these other questions. Filtering will be another question. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have some more questions? From, yes, please. Yeah, two more. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask, you mentioned the possibility of recycling the material. Did you make an effort to try out this? So could you recycle maybe materials or pieces that were not correctly made? Okay, I couldn't quite catch everything. So the question about recycling, are you asking about recycling ceramic or using other recycled materials to, to sort of bring into that mix? Actually, both would both. be interesting, but I was asking about ceramics. Okay. okay, the way ceramic is recycled is basically by grinding it up and then making and using that material. You can actually use it in the production of new ceramic. It controls shrinkage. So that's done routinely in the industry. Um, the problem normally is sort of the whole return chain, you know, is sort of not there. So usually these things end up in landfill. But you, from a material point of view, you could completely recycle it. We have not done any work where we're mixing the, the, the material with any kind of anything that comes back from the recycling stream. Um, frankly, as it is, it's already sort of, ceramic has a life on its own. The clay bodies we use are basically what artists use in the studio. So they're not highly processed. They don't go through the sort of manipulation that the industrial clay goes through. So they're, they're sort of pretty unprocessed, right? But even that clay, I mean, it, it, it's all over the place. You know, you really, it's very, very hard to predict how it's going to behave. So adding more materials to that, more uncertainty right now, that's a little bit beyond what we, I think we can handle. Um, we have done a little bit of work on uh, including sort of materials from the recycling stream that will burn in the kiln to produce some porosity. Um, but, you know, then you're releasing whatever CO2 of these materials into the air, so it, it just wasn't really that interesting, it seems. So we, right now we're not really going in that direction. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. You sort of skimmed over the machine learning aspect uh, most of the way through. You said you're using unsupervised learning. But most likely, yeah. We're yeah. not quite at that point yet, but that's probably the idea. But what, what function are you going to try to optimize? What are you trying to optimize or learn with so, the data that you're gathering? Yeah, I mean, these are great questions which we have not really worked on. I mean, we sort of, we're beginning that now. Um, we have, um, at this point, we have a lot of data. Um, we sort of need to be able to work through that data to kind of decide what is, imp what is important data, what is not important. So we don't, we don't have the answers to those questions yet. So I'm showing you sort of the first phase, which is just a fast way of capturing the data. And, uh, and these other questions, we're sort of beginning to work on those, but we don't have any of those answers yet. Just Sorry. a suggestion, you yeah. might, you sure. might take But if you have a, we should talk. Just a, Use the reinforcement learning that the 
for instance, if you're at Harvard, Boston Dynamics is using for robot mo mobility, sure. where you don't need that much upfront data. Yeah. The system learns basically mm -hmm. not to fall over. Falling over is bad, standing up is good, uh, and it learns itself. It's just an idea. Okay, yeah, great. We're working with two colleagues. Uh, one is Hans-Peter Fischer from the engineering school. He's a computer scientist, and the other is uh, Andrew Witt from the design school. So we're sort of, um, and then there's Suleiman Alotman, whose thesis is going to be on that on that topic. So yeah, well, I might I might sort of chat with you afterwards. Sure. Thank you. We have time for one question more. Okay. There is the last question. Yeah, very interesting. I follow up with the question where you have no answer. No, but just to think in a very classical way, is it not a way to reformulate the question of imperfections in classical structural engineering? So couldn't there be a tradition in, in you know, rethinking about these uncertainties in, in the way of structural shapes, which you superimpose to what you would yeah, actually... I didn't quite catch it. What did he say exactly? I didn't catch it. I didn't acoustically catch it. Hmm? I, I can speak loud. So, yeah, just because I, I, like I, yes. I couldn't hear so you. The, if you, I, I if you was, repeat I was, your question. Yes, yes. The question was a follow up a little bit. Concerning uncertainties, yeah. what about thinking the old topic of imperfections in structural engineering? Oh, right? I see. So that you would have a, a shape you see with the naked eye, but probably a, 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 an important structural mechanics question could be what are the imperfect shapes which you have on top of this, right? And there is a long tradition in civil engineering, like in, in steel engineering. What well, are the imperfections yeah, I mean, the you imperfections. think about, you know? Right. Yeah, so this. Well, I mean, this, let's say, I mean, from my vantage point, the way, let's say, in structures we deal with the uncertainties that we always have is to have, you know, safety margins and, and certain industry practices that are that geared towards dealing with those, right? Uh, and we, so I think we want to try to find a sort of slightly different approach to that. Um, and actually, to some degree, ac accept them, but sort of work with them in a way. So I think it's a slightly different mindset, but, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I'm not quite understanding what you're alluding to with the imperfections the in, in structural have, design. Not the, not the structure you are targeting at, right? But you're studying deviations from your structure, right? And you're discussing how a deviation from your ge geometrical right. design, what would be the effect of the deviation, right? And there is a long tradition in structural mechanics and nonlinear structure uh, mechanics to yeah. just think about these problems. Sometimes neglected in the classical curricula in engineering, where you just multiply everything by four, as you say, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm, I'm wondering, right, whether this would be uh, probably the type of of mechanics to put on these things in order to not be fully in the dark and to be dependent on whatever rules which we referred to before. It was just a thought. Yeah, yeah no, it's a good suggestion. A, I don't know. We'll, as we'll, as we'll think about that. You know? mechanics yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, thank you once again yeah. for a nice, nice talk. And now it's a time for coffee break. Okay.